interviewed somebody um, on Facebook the other day, and they were asking me um, how big the congregation of the church is. And I was honest with them. I said we're about 500. No, I didn't. We said <laughs> we believe in for that. Um, but I said you're around. If everyone turns up, you know what it's like on a Sunday. You know what it's like. Especially during the holiday season, we've got lots of chairs empty, but we could be one Sunday full, and the other week we could be hit and miss. But I said, we're around 50 if everyone turns up and brings their dog and cats with them on a Sunday morning as well. But um, he said, well, that's, that's a good number. I said, it is a good number. Um, but I said, isn't it interesting? I said, a bit like today, I said, I found God move stronger in, when it's a smaller number than it is in a large number. I found the presence of God move stronger in the service today than maybe I did a few weeks ago when we had a packed out place when it was a baptism service. And God's wonderful like that. Mm -hmm. And it's great that we will believe in four numbers. Yes, we are. We believe in that God will change and transform our community and our town and that this place will be full of people believing in Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. But let's hold on to the fact that even with a few numbers, the power and presence of God is still here. And that's the thing that we want more than anything else. Because if we continue to be a church that has the power and the presence of God in this place, then we'll have the men and the women and the children coming to know Him as Lord and Saviour. And they both work hand in hand. But I just want to just share that with you as I was preparing. Um, just, just this morning, just, got, just drop that in my heart just to, to share that we want to be a place but the power and presence of God is here. My title this morning for my message is simply this, Trusting in God. I've um, been in my studies recently, um, I've been studying a lot of the, the Old Testament books and um, I've just managed to get my way through Job. That was really good, really hard, but really good. Um, and now I'm reading the Psalms and I'm trying to um, go through about 10 psalms a day, just to, to read and to, to pray over, um, and so I think I'm around 70 at the moment, so I've been doing it for about 7 days, um, but one of the psalms that I was reading really spoke to me this week, and I just wanted us to bring a message from that psalm, it's Psalm 62, it's going to come up on the screen, if you haven't got a Bible with you, if you've got your Bibles, then please turn to it, I'm going to read it out to us. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. Um, it says, Truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defence. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you attack a man? How shall the slain, how shall you be slain, all of you? Like the leaning wall and a tottering fence, the only, they only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies, they bless with their mouth, and they curse inwardly. My soul waits silently for God alone, <laughs> for my expectation is from him. He is my rock and my salvation, he is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him, God is a refuge for us. Surely men of low degree are a vapour. Men of high degree are a light. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapour. Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. God has spoken once, twice I have heard this. The power belongs to God. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy. For you render to each one according to his work. A question this morning before I start anything else is, is it well with your soul? Is it well with your soul? Everything that's going on inside of you, is it sitting right with you? And most importantly, is it sitting right with God? Is there a turmoil going on inside of you? Is there a battle going on inside of you? Is it well with your soul? <coughs> Or is your soul not well at all? Verse 1 of Psalm 62 says, Truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. 
Psalm 33, 20 says, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Verse 21 and 23 of Psalm 33 says this, For our heart shall rejoice in him, because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we hope in you. In his holy name. We've just sung it out, church. The name of Jesus. I preached the message last week on the Isle of Wight, and I preached it here in this church last year, that Jesus Christ is the great I Am. And he's, when he's talking to the, he's talking to Jewish leaders um, and Jewish people, and he says, before Abraham was, I Am. And he used the same name that God used when he described himself, when Moses says, tell me who your name is. When I go to the, the people of, of Egypt, when I go to the elders of Israel, tell me the name that, that God has sent me. And God says, my name is I Am. I Am that I Am. Jesus used that name. The name that God gave himself, Jesus used that name. And that's the name that we've just been singing about. That's the name that we've just been praising about. That's the name that we're believing in that can break every chain. Because they trusted in his holy name. Verse 1 finishes by saying, From him comes my salvation. The Hebrew word used here for salvation is Yeshua. Yeshua. The name of Jesus is the name of salvation. Salvation, deliverance, prosperity, deliverance, salvation, by God we have victory, is all wrapped up in that name, Yeshua. In him and in him alone, we find salvation and deliverance and victory and prosperity and health and wealth. Whatever you want to add to that, it's all found in the name of Jesus. Verse 2, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defence. I shall not be greatly moved. He only is our rock, our refuge. A refuge is a place that gives protection or shelter from danger or trouble or unhappiness. To describe what a refuge is, there's a few um, sentences I could use. These people were seeking or taking refuge from persecution. And we know that there's a persecuted church out there that are, are doing that. But yet they're still proclaiming the name of Jesus. They're still growing as a church rapidly. The fastest growing church in the world right now is a church in Iran, where they suffer persecution like no other country in the world. Where if you're found to be a Christian, the crime is you'll be headed. And yet they're having mass baptisms in the sea. They don't care. <laughs> they don't care. There's more people being saved in Iran right now than there's ever been in the whole entire nation that they've known it. It's growing faster than the church in China. Wow. That's how great it is. Another sentence could be used, that she fled from a violent husband to a woman's refuge. You know, when we come to God, he's our safe place. He's our safe place. He's my defense, my high tower. I will not be greatly moved. I will not be shaken. When we come to God, we can stand on him. Because he alone is our firm foundation. He is the rock of our salvation. He is the one that is built, it's built upon. He's the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, the New Testament calls it, that everything is built upon Jesus Christ and we can come to him. Verse 3 and 4. Now David is sharing what people are doing to him. He's praying to God about the attacks that are coming his way. Do you know when stuff happens, church, it's okay to give it to God. When life is, is hard, God doesn't say, deal it with it yourself, try and work it out in your own way. No, he says, give it to me. Tell me what's going on. He cares about us. He cares so much that he wants to know. He wants to be involved in what's going on in our lives. And David's telling him this. You can read lots of Psalms and you can hear the pain and the anguish that's going on in David's heart because he's pouring out his heart to God and he, he says, they delight in lies. They bless with their mouths, but curse in, inwardly. God cannot stand liars. Exodus 20, verse 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. God sees and hears our words. He also sees and hears the motives of our hearts. <clears throat> Can I say today, if you lie, stop it. Confess it to God. Repent of it. Move away from it. Stop lying. To whoever you're lying to, it might be your wife, your husband, your children, 
You might be lying to work colleagues or friends. You might even be lying to yourself. Stop lying. Come to Jesus. He can set you free. Verse 5, it says, My soul, wait silently for God alone. For my expectation is from him. David's telling himself, telling his soul to wait silently for God. How many times have you had to tell yourself to do something? How many times have you had to go, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to do this? I remember when we lived in our old place in, um, in Castlebridge Road, um, Lydia thought I'd gone out. I hadn't, I was sat in the lounge. She put Joe and Ruben to bed and she came down the stairs talking to herself. I'm like, what's going on here? And she didn't realise I was in the room and when she realised that I was there, she was like, oh, and kind of like shocked herself because she was telling herself what she was going to do that day. And I'm thinking, just write yourself a list, that's what you normally give me to do. But she was telling herself what to do. David was here telling himself that my soul is going to wait silently on God. He was determining in himself that his soul was going to wait on the Lord. And that his expectation, the words in the Hebrew here means that his expectation, his hope, the thing that he longed for, was in God. What's your expectation in today? What are you hoping in today? Do you know it's okay, church, to trust him? It's okay to trust in his words. It's okay to build yourself up in him and believe what his word says. What it declares about him, his faithfulness, his power, his mercy, his works. The words of truth that are in the Bible about you. His promises, the Bible says, are yes and amen. I remember when I um, was going for my driving test. And like all good drivers, I passed on the second attempt. <laughs> but the first time, I was struggling. I was doing it in my own strength. I got really flustered. I got really um, annoyed at myself because I made a silly mistake that became not a minor but a major on my test. But the second time round, I prayed like I don't think I've ever prayed before. And I was preaching scriptures of myself and I was speaking it over my life. And I was in a completely different mindset and frame and in a different place in my heart and my spirit than I was first time round. And I was telling God all of the great works that he's done in my life and if I can pass my driving test, this is what it's going to do, I can do all these things. But I had to build myself up. I had to get rid of the, the fear and the anxiety that was holding on to me. Because once you fail the test, it, it's hard, isn't it? It's not nice. And then you've got to go through it all again. But I, I built myself up and God, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And I sailed through the second exam. Thank you, Jesus. I had to build myself up. And that's what David does here, doesn't he? He builds himself up in God's truth. And he encourages himself to hold on to the things of God. In Psalm 62, verses 5 to 7, he's just repeating Psalm 62, verse 1 and 2. says, My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He is my... He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defence. I shall not be moved. My God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. He's just repeated to himself what he's previously prayed in the first two verses. Truly my soul strongly waits on God. From him comes my salvation. For he alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my defence. I shall not be greatly moved. It's okay, church, to do that. It's okay. Can I encourage you? If you're going to pray a prayer, pray it out of the Bible. It's truth. Yeah. Pray a prayer. Pray God's words into yourself. Pray, believe it. Pray that, God, this is what your word says. I'm going to stand. I'm going to hold my trust in you. Psalm 62, verse 8 says, Trust him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge. Notice it doesn't say, trust him once. It doesn't say trust him sometimes and you try and do it the rest of yourself. No, it says trust him at all times, you people. The word trust in Hebrew means to trust, to trust in, to have confidence, be confident, to be bold, to be secure. We can be confident 
We can have confidence. We can be bold and be secure enough to know that when we trust in God, he's not going to let us down. He's not going to let us down. Because we've all had trust issues with people, haven't we? We've all put our hearts out to someone and they've let us down. They've all, we've all said, oh, that person's going to do this for us and we're going to trust them and then they've let us down. And we think that because people have done that, God's going to do that. And God doesn't work on those scales. God's someone that we can trust in completely at all times and he's never going to let us down. The Bible says that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Pour out your heart before him today is the best way to silence your soul. Whatever's going on, whatever the turmoil is, whatever the anguish is, whatever the anxiety is, pour your heart out to God and get it out of you and allow your heart and your soul to be silent before him. Let the peace and the joy that salvation comes and brings, let that be instead of whatever's going on in your heart. Part of my, my studies this week as well, um, I've been doing a study um, in my Bible app called How's Your Soul? I thought it was quite apt as I was going to be preaching on it today. And it's um, from, the, from the Bible study in, in the app that I'm using, um, it's from Judah Smith, you know the Barabbas video that I showed at Easter? And then Rob showed it a few weeks ago. And he says this. This is just a devotional for, for day one. When my soul... When is my soul home, it says, sorry. He says, I have three small children. Unfortunately, multitasking is not my strong suit. Mm -hmm. Said every dad in the world. Especially when the multiple tasks happen to be high energy, high mobile humanoids. I tend to lose track of them. That's why, in our family, one of my main jobs is to make sure our kids enjoy childhood, while Chelsea gets his wife is to make sure they actually survive it. A while back, however, Chelsea contracted a virus that affected her energy level dramatically for several months. She wasn't able to do all the accumulated things she's good at, and it's all the things that he's good at avoiding. That meant I had to gingerly, awkwardly, and amateurishly do some stuff I wasn't used to doing. You know, like the laundry, the dishes, cleaning up bodily fluids that children randomly produce. Full disclosure, grandparents, friends, nannies, babysitters, and little old ladies who didn't know me but saw me struggling in the grocery store helped massively. A lot. But let it be known, I went out of my comfort zone and I actually found myself getting comfortable with things I would previously have done anything to avoid. Somehow, I sense that, the, that most of us here reading this are unimpressed. <laughs> Don't judge me, we all have our weaknesses. Mine just happens to be wimpier than yours. Here's my point. We've naturally avoid, we naturally avoid uncomfortable, unfamiliar or awkward situations. But just because something doesn't come easily to us doesn't mean we should avoid it. When it comes to evaluating our souls, I find that a lot of people get uncomfortable. They feel awkward and anxious when they face authentic introspection. Introspection, even. Opening up to themselves or others about what is out of alignment with the insides <coughs> can sound terrifying. So they avoid soul searching at any cost, like me with household chores. How about you? When was the last time you looked at the state of your soul? How comfortable are you, are you in asking thoughtful, revealing questions about the health of your inner self? God wants to give us peace, stability, joy and hope beyond what we can imagine. For that to take place, we have to get comfortable with awkward questions. Questions about our feelings, our thoughts, our fears, our motives and our needs. Questions that are hard to answer, not just because the answers are e e e elusive, but because answers are embarrassing. Questions that reveal what's hurting us and hindering us. Even it might take some gut level courage to deal with that we, what we discover. The Apostle John wrote this to one of his close friends. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that may be good health and it goes well with your soul. That's John 3, 1 verse 2. I believe he was expressing God's heart for each of us that our souls would be happy, healthy and whole. God is committed not just to our happiness, which is 
notoriously fleeting and subjective, but to our well-being. And that our well-being starts on the inside. So don't be too afraid, too busy, or even too selfish to start paying attention to your soul. You'll be glad you did. And there's a response, is are you comfortable talking with other people about your feelings, hurts, dreams and desires? If not, why do you think that's difficult for you? Why do you think people often wait until their souls are in crisis mode before they think about them? Do you tend to do this? Take a moment to think about the state of your inner you. What are the three specific fears, feelings, assumptions or insecurities that could be affecting you? It's easy, isn't it, to quickly just bypass. We can ask ourselves a few questions, but if we don't like the answers, we won't, we won't do anything with it. But the, the opportunity is there to ask those inner questions, to say, is it well with my soul? What is going on inside of me? What are the things that are hindering me? We can trust God. I found a, a brilliant acronym for trust in God online. And I pinched it, I don't mind to say that I did, because it was very, very good. It says, trust, turning over every aspect of my life to God for T. R, realising that he's already, he, he already has a perfect plan for us. U, understanding, sorry, sorry mate. Turning over every aspect. Turning over every aspect of my life to God. I will go back to them soon. Realising that he already has a perfect plan for us. Understanding that I may not always understand. That's a big one, isn't it? No. Seeking his will every step of the way. Thanking him when things don't turn out as expected. Turning over every aspect of your life to God. Bible says that Jesus wants to be Lord of every part of our lives. Uh, someone famously once said, he said, if Jesus isn't Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. We invite him in. There's a picture in Revelation where it says Jesus is knocking at the door of our heart. Imagine that our, our, he's knocking at the door and we open up our house to him, our lives. And we say, here I go, Jesus, here's all the keys to every area of my life except that cupboard. Because in that cupboard, that's the stuff that I'm dealing with. See how crazy that sounds? <laughs> because actually, if he's Lord of all, let him have every, every area. Open everything up to him. Because he's the one that can deal with it. He's the one that can sort it out. Psalm 37, 3 to 5 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land, feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Trust in the Lord. Everything that we're doing, give it to God. You know, we make career choices, don't we? And we think, oh, this is what I want to do, but this is what God wants us to do. Well, we, we make a decision, we think, oh, this will, this will work out. And God says, well, I didn't tell you to do that. Why are you doing that? Trust in him. Bring it to him. How many times have we read in the Bible that people laid their plans out before God or inquired of the Lord to see, is this the will that you want me to do? All of the, the kings in the Old Testament went to the prophets saying, shall we attack here or should we not? Are you going to be with us? Are you going to give us victory? If not, then we're not going to do it. Let's trust in him. Let's put everything, every aspect of our lives to, over to God. Realising he already has a perfect plan for us. Jeremiah 1 verses 4 and 5 says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet of all nations. God knows us. And that promise that he had for us, I he spoke over us, uh, Jeremiah's life, sorry, is the same for us. Before he created the world, the Bible says that he knew us. Every single one of us. He knows us. Jeremiah 29, 11 goes on to say, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a hope and a future. If you're putting all of your trust in God, 
and you're putting all of your plans in his hands, guess what? You can realise that his plans are going to work out for you. It may not be the smoothest plan. It may not be the, the nicest journey, but trust me, if he's in it, it's going to work out for his good and his glory. Because the Bible never promises us that when you come to Jesus, all your troubles are going to be washed away. No, on the contrary, it's probably that your life's going to be a little bit more difficult than it probably was before. But actually, coming to him, he's going to be with us. He's never going to leave us nor forsake us. That he's going to work all things together for good for those that love him. So you might be in a situation you think, why am I in this situation? What on earth is going on? God's working it out. He sees him from the beginning to the end. He knows. And we just see one piece of the jigsaw puzzle and we think, this doesn't fit. I don't know I'm in the wrong place. But God's working it all out for his good and his glory. Understanding that I may not always understand. Job, I told you I read him recently, so I'm going to quote him. Job 13, 15. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Job 1, 20, 22. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head. I didn't do that today or this week. And he fell to the ground and worshipped and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, but the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In, in, in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. You know, sometimes when things happen that we don't understand, it's okay to understand we're not meant to know everything that's going on. And we can get ourselves worked up, can't we? And we're in a culture where we need to be, have our fingers in every pie and we need to know what's going on in every situation. And God's saying, hang on a minute, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. So how do you think on earth you're going to understand what's going on? But we think that we can. We think that we know that we, we know best. And God, please tell us and enlighten us what's going on. And sometimes it doesn't happen like that. Sometimes it's okay understanding that we know that we know to know that we're not going to understand everything. In the same way that Lydia and I have had to journey through, why did Reuben have to go through what he went through? It's okay to understand that God's with us in that. It's with He's with us to be with us, that He's never going to leave us nor forsake us. But Praise God, in the last three, four weeks, and people have heard him already today, something's happened in Reuben's vocabulary that is just mind-blowing. The fact that he came in this morning, Billy walked in the door, and he said, hello, Billy, was massive. Yeah. And so it's a massive journey, and we've, it's almost like we've turned a corner. And it's like, we're not prepared for this now, because for the last five years of his life, I mean, six years, just turned six, He's been pretty much non-verbal, had a few words, and all of a sudden, bang, the vocabulary's come in. It's like, a big hug, he's been saying, and high five, and high, and like within the last few weeks, God's been doing something in him. We've been praying about it, church. We've been asking him to do something, and now he's doing it. We can trust in him, understanding that sometimes you don't always understand what's going on, but God's working it out for his good and his glory. Yeah. He's working it out. And we're not meant to understand it all, because we can't. If his ways are higher than ours, and his thoughts are higher than ours, how on earth are we going to think we're going to understand the mysteries of God? We can't. We just have to trust in him, knowing that he's faithful, that his word says what he's going to do, that he's going to be the one that's going to work things out for his good and his glory, not my good and my glory. His good and his glory. Seeking his ways every step of the way. Proverbs 16, 1, 1 to 3. The New Living Translation says this. We can make our own plans, but the Lord gives the right answer. <laughs> How many people have been there? Oh, I want to do this. I, before um, I started training to be a minister and felt that this is what God was calling me to do, I had the call at 15, 16 as Soul Survivor. I felt God calling me to the ministry there. I had no idea how that was going to work out. And then I went to college after finishing pretty terribly at school. And they said, oh, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do a public services course. I want to be a police officer. And God's thinking, is that in my plan for you, Mark? I thought I had this brilliant idea that I was going to do this. And within half a year of being at college, that kind of just fell flat on its face. Um, and I just said, OK, God, your way. And I didn't realise that meant I was going to have to leave college, go and work at various um, places to be trained up 
and then realise it's going to start off at KFC and then lead to the Sainsbury's and then lead to working for Boots and then doing my training from church, long distance learning. But that's the way God wanted me to do it. And I trusted him in that. I gave over my plans to him and I seeked him every step of the way. Because, you know, people may be pure in their own eyes, but the Lord examines our motives. We may have these wonderful ideas thinking, I'm going to do it this way and it's going to be, be brilliant. But God can see the motive of our hearts. He can see if we're doing it for him or we're doing it for ourselves. Are we trying to build his kingdom or are we trying to build our little empire? Mm -hmm. And God always sees the motive of our hearts. He always can see that. And we think because people can't, God can't. Well, God can. God sees what's going on in our heart. God sees the things that drive us to do what we're doing. It says, commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. Give them to him and they'll succeed. Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For anyone who asks, receive. And anyone who seeks, finds. To him who knocks, it will be open. We're not coming to a God that is far off and we have to make our way up to the journey and say, God, can we have a conversation with you? I've got this idea. It's just a prayer. Mm -hmm. It's just a simple, God, this is what's going on. Is this right for me? Is this right for, for what you want to do in my life? Are these plans that I've got your plans for me? Or is it my plans that I want to do what I want to do? Lord, I don't want to do that. I want to do what you've called me to do. Thanking him when things don't turn out as expected. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, Do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And people lose that. It's quite easy to read that quickly and forget. Do not worry about anything. Lots of people here can quite easily say, I don't worry, but I can look at you and look at your lives and say, you're worrying. <laughs> you're worrying. The Bible says, do not worry. And that's the hardest lesson to learn. It's the hardest thing because trust in him is saying, God, you handle it. You deal with it. I'm not going to deal with it. And there's an element there, there's responsibilities that we have to do. There's some things that we have to put right in place. But the Bible goes on to say, what does worrying do? It doesn't add anything to you. It doesn't add number to your days, does it? Instead, pray about everything. Pray, 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 church. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. That understanding thing again. That peace that surpasses all understanding. When that comes and we think, I'm in the middle of the most crazy situation in my life. But you know what? I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to pray, pray, pray into it. And that peace that comes that surpasses all understanding. When people look at you and think, how on earth did you get through that? How on earth are you still saying that that situation is going on? Because I've got the peace of God about it. What do you mean you've got the peace of God about it? Well, I've been praying about it and God's peace is, is there and I'm trusting him. Oh, you're a nutter. Yeah, probably, but you know what? I'm going to trust God in it. His peace, which what guards your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. That peace that surpasses all understanding, that our hearts and minds will not be affected by those things that want to replace what God's doing. So we can still be silently waiting on God in our souls. <clears throat> that the fear and the anxiety and the worry and the stress and whatever else is affecting us doesn't affect us anymore because we're praying about it. And that peace that surpasses all understanding guards our hearts and our minds. Let's look at the last few verses from Psalm 62 together. Psalm 62, 9 to, 9 to 12 says, Surely men of low degree are a vapour. Men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, then they are altogether lighter than vapour. Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. God has spoken once, twice I have heard this. The power belongs to God. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy. For you render each one according to his work. So tempting, isn't it, to use honour, power, wealth, prestige to measure people. We look at such people and think, oh, you're getting on a right in life. 
Look at you. Look what you've got. You've done. You've done well. The Bible says it, but on God's scales, people are just a mere breath, a puff of air, a vapour. What then can tilt the scales when God weighs us? It goes on to say in that scripture, don't set your heart on riches. Trust in him. Trusting in God and serving him, <coughs> working for him is what he wants. Also to you, it belongs mercy, for you render to each one according to his work. God sees what we do for him. God inspects our hearts. That's what weighs. That's what tilts the scales. God sees our heart. God sees what we do to serve him. Not what we're doing behind closed doors that I think, oh, that's, that's not what God's saying. But he sees our hearts. He sees the motives. We can think that, oh, just because this person might have wealth or honour or power or prestige, do you know, it adds nothing to our value in God's eyes. Because in our eyes, we're valued enough because he purchases with the blood of Jesus Christ. What is more powerful or more precious or more valuable than the blood of Jesus Christ? Absolutely nothing. Because he's washed us clean. He's ransomed us. He paid the price that we deserved. Sin and hell. He paid the price. What more can we add? It doesn't matter what wealth or prestige or honour we may have. That's nothing. But our faithful work we do to him has eternal value. And it's not about salvation through works. It's not about that. But we serve him because of what he's done in our lives. Because he served us, we serve him. That's how it works. It's not we serve him for salvation. It doesn't work like that because we can never earn it. But we serve him because he first served us. We've just read about well, I, I did communion early on, and it says before the night that the disciple, he was betrayed, he, he broke bread. But even before then, he washed the disciples' feet. He did the lowest of the lowest jobs that a servant could do. It wasn't like, oh, let's walk to Weymouth or we'll get the bus to Weymouth. No, they walked across the desert. It was filthy. They were, walked through the most horrible things. And he bent down and he washed the disciples' feet. It was the lowest job a servant could do. And Jesus willingly did it. He served the servant king. And that's why we serve him. That's why we do what we do. That's why we want to see his kingdom extended. And we serve him because he first served us. We follow in his example. We don't try and make and earn our salvation because we never could. But we serve him because he first served us. Let's close in prayer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, I want to thank you for you being here today. Being in our presence, being in our midst. Lord, we thank you. Lord, that you work all things together for good for those that love you. Lord, I pray, Father, that as we put our trust in you, as we learn to trust you, Lord, when circumstances and situations might not be going the way that we think they should be going. <laughs> Lord, help us to understand that sometimes it's okay to understand that we're not going to understand it all. Mm. Help us, Lord, to put our trust in you. Father, we thank you that our hope is in you, Lord, that you are our expectation. Lord, help us, Father, to have healthy expectations of you. Mm. Lord, help us, Lord as we trust you, as we commit our things and our plans into your hands, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you work them out, Lord, for your good and your glory. Lord, that you would use our lives as a testimony and lives of sacrifice of worship to you. Lord, that will draw men and women to a relationship with you. Lord, that's our prayer. Lord, we want to see your kingdom come. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. 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 Praise God.